to a special book lecture with Physicians Committee's President, Dr. Neil Barnard. Dr. Barnard was in the middle of a 40 city lecture tour for his new book, Your Body in Balance, when everything changed about the way we gather and the way we communicate with each other. And we had so many people helping arrange these lectures like Linda Middlesworth in Sacramento, Pam Popper in Columbus, Alicia Serkin in Aspen and Jacob Brokus in Asheville. And until Dr. Barnard is able to see you in person, the Physicians Committee is very pleased to be able to connect with you in this way and have Dr. Barnard bring you the life-saving information that is contained in his new book. So there are a few Zoom features available to you. If you click the Q&A icon, you can type in a question and Dr. Barnard will get to as many as he can at the end of the lecture. And there is a chat icon. And with such a wonderful turnout today, if you'd like to jump in and tell us where you're joining us from, we'd love to hear from you throughout the event. So Dr. Neil Barnard is the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, founder of the Barnard Medical Center, adjunct professor of medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine, and a fellow of the American College of Cardiology. His federally funded diabetes research revolutionized the nutritional approaches to type 2 diabetes, and he now aims to empower people with life-changing information on hormones and health. This is Dr. Barnard's 20th book. So in the middle of this global health crisis, we need information about how we can optimize the things about our health that we can control. So let me turn it over now to Dr. Neil Barnard to share the life-changing and life-saving information contained in his new book, Your Body in Balance. Dr. Barnard. Thank you, Betsy. Thanks to all of you for joining me today. Uh, we're going to talk about Your Body in Balance. We're going to talk about health and the surprising connections between foods and hormones and how we feel from day to day. Before we do that though, I know that COVID-19 is on everybody's mind and people are wondering, what does food have to do with any of that? Um, are there things that I can choose to make me healthier or safer? And I'd like to start there if you don't mind. Let me share my screen with you. I have a few slides that I'd like to share. Okay, I hope you can see that all right. Um, first of all, 90% of COVID-related deaths are related to underlying medical conditions. You already know about this, right? If you have hypertension, if you have diabetes, if you have a lung disease or asthma or you're a smoker, or if you have heart disease, you are more likely to have a bad outcome if the virus ends up uh, in your lungs. Um, whereas if you don't have any of these things and you get the virus, you're more likely to do well. And this also led to some racial inequities that have been very disturbing. And this, a recognition of this began about a month ago. In April, as of April 3rd, in Milwaukee County, it was reported that although African Americans were 26% of the population, they accounted for 81% of deaths. And in the state of Michigan, something similar, African Americans were 40% of the population, 14% uh, of the population, 40% of deaths. And in Washington, D.C., African Americans were about 46% of the population, but 58% of deaths. What's going on? Well, when we look across different races, we see that obesity occurs more often in African Americans compared to whites. The same is true for diabetes. Now, if you can't see the numbers on the right-hand side of your screen, if you wish, you can either minimize the pictures of the speakers, um, or you can actually drag them to a different part of your screen. That way you'll be able to see everything I'm showing you. Uh, obesity, 38% of African Americans, 29% of whites. Diabetes, 12% versus 7%. Hypertension, 41% of African Americans versus a much smaller number, 28% of non-Hispanic whites. Okay, so when COVID-19 first emerged in China, right away the role of, of blood pressure came in. Four out of every 10 people who did very badly uh, with COVID-19 had high blood pressure. And so the suspicion fell actually on blood pressure medications. There are very common medications called ACE inhibitors. The most common one is called lisinopril. 
um, or ARBs, angiotensin II receptor blockers. If you have hypertension, you're very likely to be prescribed one of these drugs. Well, researchers discovered that these medications increase the, uh, an enzyme on the surface of the cell. That enzyme is called the angiotensin converting uh, enzyme 2, ACE2. Why does that matter? Because that enzyme happens to be exactly the point where the virus attaches. So somebody sneezes, the virus comes through the air, you inhale it, and what it does is it is looking for the ACE2 enzyme, and if it's on the surface of a lung cell, that's exactly where it sticks, and then it gets sucked into the cell. And it turned out that people who take these medications have more of those enzymes, more of those welcome mats, if you will, for the virus. So researchers started to say, wait a minute, maybe people with high blood pressure are at risk, not because of their blood pressure, but they're at risk because of the medications that they're taking. Now, researchers have been looking back and forth and back and forth, and some said, no, no, you're, you're taking these medications, they're very helpful, they're lowering your blood pressure, that's good, that will help you in the, with the virus. So which is right? Are these medications damaging and making the viral infection worse, or are they helpful, making viral infection better? Uh, there was a recent, a fairly large article, the best evidence that we have so far is that they're neither one. They're not really uh, making the virus infection better, and they're not really making it worse. Stay tuned for more information. But what we do know, oh, oh and by the way, um, medications that do bring blood pressure down, that's important they, because high blood pressure can be deadly. But what we do know is that you can get your blood pressure down to a great degree with diet changes alone. Now, by all means, see your doctor, talk to your doctor about whether you need medications or not. But more than 20 years ago, the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension study, the DASH study, brought in more than 400 people. And they wanted to see what can foods do for somebody with high blood pressure. And this graph is blood pressure, specifically systolic blood pressure. The top line is people who didn't change. As you can see, their blood pressure didn't change much either. The second line is people who increased their vegetables and fruits. And as you can see, their blood pressure went down. The third line is people, this, this is a group of people who increased vegetables and fruits, but they took another step. They reduced meat and they reduced fat. And that combination reduced their blood pressure even more. Now that's systolic blood pressure, that, that's the top number. If your blood pressure is 120 over 80, 120 is systolic. The 80 is diastolic, that's the bottom number. Uh, and if you're wondering what these names mean, systolic blood pressure is when your heart beats, diastolic is when your heart relaxes. So your blood pressure goes up to 120, down to 80, up to 120, down to 80 with every heartbeat. So as you can see, the diastolic blood pressure does the same thing. If you cut down on meat, cut down on fat, increase vegetables, increase fruits, your blood pressure is gonna drop. But the reason I'm showing you this is that many people may have the idea Sure, swell. I bet that if I didn't have high blood pressure, maybe I'd do better if I got the virus. But who has time? This could take months for me to get better. Uh, I can change my diet now. I won't be healthier until sometime next year. Well, wait a minute. This was an eight-week study, and the DASH diet improved blood pressure within two weeks within 14 days. So the reason this is so important is there are many people who are going to get infected with this virus in June in July, in August, if right now they follow the DASH diet, or better still, get the meat off their plate completely, really lower the fat, and not just increase vegetables and fruits, but make their whole diet, vegetables, fruits, beans, whole grains, plant-based foods, not only will their blood pressure drop quickly in many cases, but it will drop decisively. And you can add exercise to it, and as you gradually lose weight, many people get off their medications or reduce them. Okay, the same is true with diabetes. This is our own diabetes research study, one of many. Uh, this one we reported back about 15 years ago. The blue line here is people on a vegan diet, and we're looking at hemoglobin A1C, the main measure of blood sugar control. And as you can see, it's far better than the red line, which is a conventional diet. A plant-based diet not only reduces blood pressure, it also improves diabetes control, and it even allows some people to get off their medications, in some cases to get rid of their diabetes altogether. And it happens quickly. We've got that time. 
Okay, so the Medical Society of the District of Columbia actually asked the mayor of DC to make messaging on these points paramount. In fact, three things. Number one, stop smoking. One in seven Americans still smokes. Many kids are still vaping. And stopping smoking will in improve your lung function within six weeks. Secondly, optimize your medications. Many people aren't taking their medications the way the doctor ordered. And in some cases, they might be over-medicated. So now is the time to talk with your caregiver and say, do I really need these medications for my blood pressure? Or can I restore a lapsed prescription? Whatever it is, get back on track. But most importantly, implement diet changes. A plant-based diet is the way to go, and it works fast. If we put this to work, we can be more resilient. Yes, you need to wash your hands. Yes, we need masks. Yes, we need social isolation, all these kinds of things, social distancing. However, sometimes these uh, measures fail, and if we're, our body is stronger, we'll be able to, to do better in the event that, that the virus hits. Okay, are there more things that we can do? If you'd like, I, I want to walk you through some of the foods that people have looked at for their antiviral effects. And let me start with garlic. You've heard people say garlic is a, a blood purifier, uh, or maybe it has antiviral effects. Well, what's the truth of this? Uh, there was a, uh, and by the way, let me confess, I am a bit of a garlic skeptic. Um, I thought the people who are advocating for garlic and saying it has health benefits are just people who love Italian food. But I have to say, there was a really good study, came out in 2001, pretty big study, 146 people participated. Um, and what they did is that everybody got a capsule, uh, like a little pill that you would take. And some of them had a garlic extract in them, others had a placebo, it, they were just dummy pills, they didn't do anything. And so some of the people got the garlic, some got the placebo for 12 weeks, right in the middle of cold virus season. And what they found was that first of all, the people taking the placebo had 65 colds, all, all the, the whole group, 65 colds during that 12 week period. But the garlic group, only 24. Now, did they take sick days? Yeah, 366 sick, sick days in the placebo group, only 111 in the garlic group. Okay, so now I have to say, I dug into this and in the fine print I discovered that this study was actually funded by a group that has an economic interest uh, in these in garlic supplements. It's, it's a place called the Garlic Center. Um, that's it. Even so, uh, even, though, even though there is that conflict of interest, I have to say it was a very well done study and very compelling. So if you want to have some garlic, go for it. Um, okay, shifting gears. Obesity. I mentioned obesity as an underlying uh, condition that makes COVID worse. It's true, and this is not news. We saw this back in 2009, there was the H1N1 virus came out, and it started in the United States, and in California, researchers looked at who got it and who didn't, and it turned out that among California adults who contracted H1N1, over half of them were obese. And we're gonna come back to, to what that's about, but obesity appears to allow the body to trap uh, pathogenic viruses. Uh, that's true of COVID apparently as well. All right, but it's not necessarily just body fat. It can also be fatty diets. High fat diets interfere with what are called natural killer cells. These are white blood cells. You know, if, if you take a blood sample, uh, your blood has red blood cells that carry oxygen. You also have white blood cells and your white blood cells are your soldiers. They are looking for viruses that don't belong there. They're looking for bacteria and they knock them out. Some of these white blood cells are called natural killer cells, meaning they shoot first and ask questions later. They, they don't need to be primed to go after a virus. If it's there, they're gonna grab it. But researchers have looked at the effect of fatty diets and they've done it in several ways. One way is to feed fa fatty foods to individuals. A second way is to actually drip fat into their veins. Believe it or not, researchers have done this. And the third way is to mix fat with cells in the test tube. In all of these cases, they have found that white blood cells don't function very well in a fatty environment. So bring in the vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans, but let's prepare them without lots of added grease and added oils, okay, make sense? All right, what about dairy products? People have been looking at dairy for a long time. You remember I talked about the underlying conditions, lung disease. 
is one of those underlying conditions that makes, makes COVID worse, and one of them is asthma. Uh, but researchers way back in 2004 looked at children who had asthma, and they gave them a special diet. They excluded dairy products. They also excluded eggs. And what they found was a significant improvement in what's called peak expiratory flow rate. That, that just means a, a child with asthma who's normally got a vice on his lungs suddenly could breathe again. Their lungs were working better. Um, if you have asthma, or if you have a child with asthma, or if you know anyone who does, run, do not walk to a completely plant-based diet. Get rid of the dairy completely and see how you do. For many people, it's just a dramatic difference. All right, what about vitamins and minerals? Let me tackle vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc. Vitamin C, um, you know Linus Pauling. Remember Linus Pauling, the double Nobel uh, laureate? Um, when he died, he was taking 18 grams of vitamin C per day. That's, that's a lot. Um, he, was very, he was convinced that it had an antiviral effect. Well, is it true? Is it not true? Uh, there was a good study in the UK. Researchers brought in 57 older folks, and they all had some lung uh, inflammation, either bronchitis or bronchopneumonia. They gave them quite a modest dose of vitamin C. It wasn't 18 grams. It was just 200 milligrams or else they gave them a placebo and they compared. And over a four week period, what they found is that there was a significant clinical improvement in the vitamin C group. In other words, those people, they were there, they were in the hospital, they had bronchi uh, bronchitis or bronchopneumonia, they did substantially better if they got the vitamin C. So my recommendation is number one, vitamin C rich foods. Yes, it's in citrus fruits, but it's also in broccoli and vegetables uh, as well. So a plant strong diet. Um, and if you want to supplement, uh, many, many people will take this to about uh, maybe a gram, that's a thousand milligrams per day, maybe some, something along those lines. To do beyond that is really kind of going beyond the research. Uh, vitamin D. Vitamin D normally comes from sunlight on your skin. And as long as human beings were living in equatorial Africa, um, we got plenty of vitamin D. But my own forebears had the bad judgment to, to uh, travel to North Dakota, where there's not a whole lot of sun, especially in the wintertime. And uh, so if you're not getting much sunlight on your skin, you can be low in vitamin D. And this is actually true in lots of places. Um, so in that case, people will need to supplement. And uh, the usual amount of supplementation that doctors recommend nowadays is maybe about 2,000 international units per day. Does it do anything? Well, there was a meta-analysis that combined the results of 25 studies. It was a big group almost 11,000 participants altogether. And in those studies where people supplemented vitamin D, they did have fewer respiratory infections, not huge, but about 12%, except that when you looked at the people who were really low in vitamin D to start with, in, in that case, uh, if they gave them uh, vitamin D supplementation, they did really quite dramatically better, about a 70% reduction in risk. Okay, uh, let's talk about zinc. Uh, with zinc, you probably know the product Cold Ease. You go into a pharmacy and they, they have it right there with all the various cold medications, sort of a sugary droplet that you, you take every couple hours. Um, this company has actually invested quite a lot in the research on this topic. And I have to say, it's rather interesting to see what's happened. Um, at Wayne State University back in 2007, uh, researchers wanted to look at zinc. They brought in 50 participants. They were a little bit middle-aged and older. And they found that if they gave them zinc for, for over uh, a one year period, there was a significant reduction in risk of infections. That's good. However, zinc is a metal. And if you aren't getting enough zinc, it's bad. But if you're getting too much zinc, it can be bad as well. Just as too much iron or too much copper can be toxic. You wanna to be sort of in, the, in the, the healthy balance range, too much zinc can be toxic. So the, anyway, so back to Coldies. The people who sell this commercial product, and, and I'm not necessarily recommending it, but, but what they will say is, don't take it unless you've got a cold coming on. And at your first symptom, then you take it. And it doesn't make the cold go away. What it does is it shortens the duration of the cold. So if you wanted to, if you have a, a cold, you can uh, prospectively just see the extent to, the, to which these things work. Combining the vitamin C with the zinc, have some garlic, and just find out over time if it works for you. 
Uh, a note of caution, there are, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of commercial pressure to suggest that these things work. And I think you should take everything with a grain of salt. But on the other hand, be safe about it and see what's helpful for you. Okay, let me now shift gears. I want to talk about what we were supposed to be talking about, which was your body and balance and how uh, foods can affect hormones. And for me, this started one day when I was sitting at my desk and a young woman named Robin called me up and she was feeling terrible. And uh, I asked, what's the problem? She said, I can't get out of bed. I've got terrible menstrual cramps. I said, tell me what you're going through. And this is what she was basically going through. She said, this is not fun. I am miserable. One day every month, she had cramps that were bad enough that she couldn't really function at work on that particular day. And maybe one in 10 women has cramps that are that bad. So I suggested something to her that I don't think any doctor had ever suggested to a patient before. I said, let me give you some painkillers for a couple of days to get you through the current situation. But to stop this from happening again, let me suggest that we avoid animal products completely and keep oils very low. Now, wait a minute. That sounds like a diet for hypertension or a diet for diabetes. Why would I suggest that for menstrual cramps? Here's why. As she was describing her symptoms, I suddenly realized that it related to estrogens, female sex hormones. And we learned a long time ago that by increasing fiber and reducing fat, estrogens get into better balance. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Uh, oh, well, well, first, let me describe a study that we did. The young woman took my advice. Uh, she changed her diet. It was, her diet was totally vegan and also very low in fat. And when the next month arrived, her, her cycle next arrived, she had no pain at all. And she called me, back, called me back to say, this is amazing. I'm effectively cured. And then the month after that and the month after that, she, she was fine. But if she would modify her diet and bring the greasy stuff back, the pain came back too. So I was convinced this really seemed to matter for this one person. We needed to see if it would help more broadly. So I brought in a large group of women uh, under the auspices of Georgetown University's Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Half the women started the diet as I described vegan, low fat. The other half started a supplement. It was a, effectively a dummy pill, a placebo. And after two months, they switched. The diet group started the supplement. The supplement group started the diet. And what we found is that it works. Um, when women, and th we published our results in the journal Obstetrics and Gynecology, and we found that the, the amount of pain that people had both in intensity and duration, significantly dropped with the diet change. Aha, well that's good, but we discovered something else. We asked all of the participants to not use any hormone medications in the course of the study because hormones would be a confounder, it would goof up the, the research, it would interfere with the research. So uh, if, a, if a woman say was taking birth control pills, we asked that she use some other kind of contraceptive method for the duration of the study. Well, in the course of the study, one of the women said, you know, you don't have to worry about me. My husband and I don't use any kind of contraception at all. Years ago, we were evaluated to see why we couldn't get pregnant. She said, it's not him, it's me. I'm infertile, I don't ovulate, and so we don't use contraception. So I don't need the pill, I don't need anything, don't worry. Well, the second month that she was on the low-fat vegan diet, she came in and said, Dr. Barnett, I have some bad news and some good news. And I said, what is it? And she said, well, the bad news is I'm leaving your study. And the good news is I am pregnant. <laughs> yes, she was pregnant. Um, she gave birth to a healthy baby. And several years later, she came to a lecture that I gave. And she had three children. Here's my point. The first woman had a diagnosis of dysmenorrhea, men menstrual pain. The second woman had a diagnosis, infertility. My goal is to take an eraser and just wipe out those diagnoses. Uh, because the truth is, in, in both cases, they were normal, healthy people who were out of balance in their hormones. And a diet change gets your hormones back in balance. Okay, so what are hormones? What am I talking about? What is a hormone? How does food affect it? Okay, hormones are really like letters. A letter in the mail goes from the post office 
uh, to your house. Uh, hormones are instructions. So, for example, um, in, a, in a, a person's body, the, the thyroid gland makes thyroid hormone that goes to the cells and gives them energy. In a woman's body, the ovaries make estrogens, female sex hormones, that go to the reproductive organs to get them ready for pregnancy. Or in a man's body, the testes make testosterone that I guess gets in his bloodstream and makes him want to run for president, whatever the case may be. Anyway, you get the idea. Hormones go from the site where they're made through the bloodstream and there they give instructions to other parts of the body. Now, you can have hormone haywire for two reasons. One is you don't have enough letters in the mail. You don't have enough hormones going from one part of your body to another. The second is you can have too many letters in the mail. You can have uh, too many instructions and so your body doesn't know what to do. So either way, you wanna get your body in balance. All right, let's go back to the beginning. I talked to, uh, to you about a woman who had terrible menstrual pain. This is the amount of estrogen, female sex hormone in a woman's blood over the course of a month. Now, when I say estrogen, there actually are several estrogens, estradiol, estrone, estriol. I'm gonna lump them all together. I'm gonna to call them estrogen. At the beginning of the month, there's not much estrogen in her blood, but then over the next two weeks, that curve rises to a peak and then it falls. She's ovulating, an ovary is releasing an egg. And then over the next week, the uterus is the most optimistic organ in the body. Every month, it is convinced we are gonna get pregnant this month for sure. So the amount of estrogen slowly rises to thicken up the inner lining of the uterus. It's called the endometrium. And that with, with extra estrogen in the blood, that endometrial lining thickens up in anticipation of pregnancy. But then after about another week, the disappointed uterus discovers we're not pregnant again, and the amount of estrogen falls, and that whole inner lining is broken up and released as menstrual flow. Now, the point is that that curve can go up or down depending on what you eat. If you eat in a certain way, you'll have too much estrogen causing more pain over the course of the month. Let me show you how this looks. This is the uterus. You see that pink uh, inner lining in the middle and off on the side, those are uh, the fallopian tubes and the ovaries off on the side. Okay, in the middle of your screen, you see the, the uterus and that inner lining is the endometrium. And it's quite normal for that to enlarge every month. It thickens up. However, what if you have too much estrogen in your blood. What can happen is that now that endometrial lining thickens up too much and then it produces prostaglandins. These are compounds that cause terrible pain uh, and they get into your bloodstream and make you feel crummy. So too much estrogen, too much thickening of the endometria, uh, endometrium pr produces prostaglandins and makes you hurt. Okay, so wait a minute. I don't want all those estrogens. I want to get back in balance. How can foods help me? To answer that question, I want to share the story of Catherine. Catherine was uh, Louisiana, grew up in Louisiana. She was in the Air Force as an aerospace engineer, and she was one of the first people to go into Iraq in 2003. Now, when you're in a war zone, you're working really hard, and you're eating the food the government gives you, uh, you don't gain any weight. But eventually, her tour of duty came to an end, and the government shipped her back stateside and her friends took her out to eat, and Catherine and her family made up for all the things that she hadn't had when she was over in Iraq, starting with macaroni and cheese. She loved it. In fact, she loved cheese in all its forms. And she had a friend, actually, who gave her, for her birthday, an entire case of macaroni and cheese dinners, 48 boxes that she ate, I'm not making this up, for 48 days straight. Hmm. Well, Catherine gained weight. But something else happened. She started to develop pain in her abdomen and it got worse and it got worse and it worse. It was especially bad with her cycle, but even between times it was not well. And eventually a doctor did a laparoscopy. That's where you look inside with a little tube. You look into the abdomen, you make an incision below the belly button, insert the tube. The doctor said, ah, endometriosis. And the doctor explained this is causing your pain, but it can also lead to infertility. 
Uh, what's happening is that cells that are lining the uterus appear to escape up the fallopian tubes where they then implant all around the abdomen. They can attach to the intestinal tract. They can attach to the ovaries and fallopian tubes, and that leads to pain and it can lead to infertility, as I said. She tried medical treatments and hormonal treatments and nothing was knocking it out. And finally her doctor said, okay, well, there's another treatment that we can do, and that's a hysterectomy. Well, Catherine was 27, and she and her husband were sort of newlyweds, and she wasn't too keen on the idea of having her reproductive organs all removed. Um, but her doctor said, well, you're almost certainly infertile anyway because of the endometriosis. Looking at her options, she had pain every day. It was not going away, it was getting worse. And, and by the way, she's not alone. There are many women who have endometriosis. And in some cases, it is uh, excruciating. She didn't have any much of any choice. And she said, all right, we'll do the hysterectomy, fair enough. Before she could have the procedure, a friend convinced her to see a nutritionist. She had six weeks before the procedure could be scheduled. She thought, all right, I'll do this. The nutritionist advised her to follow effectively the diet that I described for menstrual pain, getting rid of the animal products, keeping oils very, very low. She did it and she started to feel better. She discovered that she was losing weight, her energy was getting better, she was feeling better and better and better. And when the day for her procedure arrived, she dutifully went to the hospital and they anesthetized her and prepared to do the hysterectomy. An hour later, she woke up in the recovery room. The doctor was shaking her on the shoulder and saying, Catherine, I need you to wake up. I gotta got tell you something. I didn't do the hysterectomy. You still have your uterus. When I looked inside with the laparoscope and I was prepared to take your uterus out, the endometriosis was effectively gone. What you did have is a lot of scarring where it had been, and that's why you still had some residual pain, and you had some adhesions where, where the scars would attach one part of your body to another. All I had to do was free that up, but the endometriosis itself has somehow gone away. And her mother was in the room with her and said, well, she went vegan. And of course the doctor is saying, stop it. You know, foods don't cause endometriosis and there's no way that a diet change is gonna make it go away. There's only one explanation for this, says the doctor. This is a miracle. Uh-huh. I think that's written in her medical chart somewhere. Anyway, miracle or not, here's the point, that she had been on eating cheese. Cheese contains estrogens, and that drives the process. There she is. She lost a lot of weight on her vegan diet, and she now has three children. No, she was not infertile. Uh, in fact, she's now one of PCRM's uh, Food for Life instructors, and she has her own center in Dallas to teach other women how to take back their own health. Okay, so wait a minute. Cheese, mac and cheese, cheese snacks. Does cheese have hormones in it? Well, milk comes from a cow and the cow is pregnant. Wait, let me just walk you through a little biology 101. Um, cows don't give milk. Well, cows actually never give milk. People take their milk. Uh, but to, to, get, to, to, to make a cow produce milk, every cow in every dairy is artificially inseminated on an annual basis. And this is not done with great uh, delicacy, may I say. Um, and there's a lot of issues about it, uh, not the least of which is that their calves are taken away from them. Their, their male calves are all killed uh, as veal. The female calves are taken away and then raised in isolation uh, until they're old enough to be artificially inseminated themselves. And by about age four, the cows are all killed rather than being allowed to live out the normal 20 or so years of life that a cow would normally have. So there's a lot of creepy parts of it. But from a biological standpoint, pregnant cows make estrogens. Pregnant cows make estrogen that end up in their blood, plasma, but also in their milk. It's not a lot, it's just a trace, but it's more than enough to affect human biology. And no, there is no such thing as milk that doesn't have hormones in it. The hormones are made by the cow. I'm not talking now about hormones injected into the cow. I'm talking about the hormones the cow's body makes naturally because the cow is pregnant and the cow is milked during pregnancy. So this can affect men. Researchers went into a fertility clinic in Rochester, New York, 
and some of the men were eating about a half a serving of cheese per day, some men were eating more cheese, and the men eating the most cheese had the lowest sperm counts. Really, could it be that consuming cheese means you're getting a load of estrogens every single day, and that that in turn could affect something like a man's fertility? Well, it's only a trace of cheese. I, I'm only a trace of, of estrogens in, in cheese. However, the average man and woman consumes about 37 pounds of cheese every year in the United States, um, plus milk, plus butter, plus ice cream, plus yogurt, plus all the dairy that's baked into to cookies and cakes. We're consuming a lot of dairy products and you're getting estrogen in every single bite. And yes, it's more than enough to affect something delicate, uh, like um, male sexual uh, uh, function, as well as uh, breast cancer. The more dairy a woman eats, the more likely she is to die of breast cancer if she had breast cancer. We're gonna come back to breast cancer in a minute. Okay, uh, but before, I, I wanna say another word for men. This scenario occurs in just about every clinic in America. Guy walks into the doctor's office and says, Doc, I'm having trouble with my, my uh, nature, he says. And the doc says, I'm not quite sure I follow. So the patient says, I, I mean, I'm, I can't raise the flag, doc. So the doctor says, oh, I understand. You're looking for a Viagra prescription, I'll bet. The patient says, exactly. So the doctor says, I can write you out a prescription. In fact, here it is, Viagra, 50 milligrams, da, 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 da. The, the patient says, thanks, doc. Takes the prescription, walks out of the office. At that point, the doctor drops his pen, races after the patient, grabs him before he goes down the elevator and says, we're not finished. I need you to come back. We need to talk. The doctor explains to the patient that the reason that he has erectile dysfunction has nothing to do with performance anxiety. The reason he has erectile dysfunction is because he has narrowed arteries. The, the, the male sexual anatomy is sort of a hydraulic system. It, it was obviously designed, devised on a Monday because things are going wrong with it all the time, uh, but you need blood supply for it to work. If there's not adequate blood flow to the man's private parts, like nothing happens. So doctors have learned a long time ago that if a man has got erectile dysfunction, he just doesn't have enough blood flow. That's the most, by far the most common reason for erectile dysfunction in middle-aged men. And the reason that he has reduced blood supply is that he has atherosclerosis. And at this point in the speech, the patient says to the doc, what is atherosclerosis? The doctor explains, these are like little blisters, little, almost like raised scars on your arteries. You're eating chicken and fish and bacon and meat, animal products that give you cholesterol, that give you animal fat, that stimulates the production of cholesterol in your body. And these little raised bumps form, that's atherosclerosis. And if you narrow the arteries to your private parts, you can have erectile dysfunction. And the patient says, okay, thanks doc, I think I understand. And the doctor says, no, there's something more. If you have this process happening in the narrow arteries to your private parts, this is also happening in a slightly bigger coronary arteries that go to your heart, and the bigger artery, the carotid arteries going to your brain, meaning that you are at much higher than average risk of a heart attack or stroke within the next three to five years. And Viagra doesn't treat that. So take the Viagra if you want to, but before you leave the clinic, I want you to see the dietitian and talk about starting the only diet that reverses atherosclerosis, and that's a low-fat, healthy, plant-based diet, okay? All right, so, wow, what else affects our hormones? Well, we've talked about cheese, dairy products, contributing estrogen to the system, but your body actually has a way of getting rid of excess estrogens. It happens in the liver. The liver's at the top of the screen, that big red organ, that's your liver. It removes excess estrogens, it sends it down that green bile duct into the intestine. And the estrogens go right out with the waste. That's great. Except this all depends on one thing, it depends on fiber. Now, I know that's a boring word, fiber is plant roughage, but it's extremely important. 
uh, beans, vegetables, fruits, whole grains have, have roughage. It goes through the intestinal tract, and as it does, it picks up that estrogen and carries it out with the waste. You are literally flushing away excess estrogens. But what if your lunch was chicken breast, yogurt, eggs, uh, steak? They're not plants. They don't have any fiber at all. So if that happens, then the liver still sends the estrogens into the intestine, but there's no fiber there to hold on to it. So the estrogens end up being reabsorbed back into your bloodstream and they go back up to the liver and they recirculate again and again and again until you follow a healthy plant-based diet and that carries the fiber into your intestinal tract to pick up the estrogens and flush it away. So in the same way that cheese and other dairy products contribute estrogens into the system, fiber from plants helps carry it out. Okay, I wanna make sure you're paying attention. Spam, does it have fiber or does it have no fiber? Aha, okay. I want you to give me a one saying that it's got lots of fiber or two that Spam does not have fiber in it at all. Okay, good. Well, luckily I have a trash can and the Spam can go right in it. Uh, how about KFC? Fiber? If you think it has fiber, give me a one. If you say it's got no fiber, give me a two. Well, the chicken really doesn't have fiber. There's a little bit in the carton. If you ate that, you get a little bit of fiber, but I think it's going in the trash also. Uh, now, there are some things that actually started out as plants, but they've been changed so much, the fiber's been removed, and they are going in the trash as well. Okay, so avoid dairy, uh, get plenty of vegetables and fruits. Now, let's shift gears a little bit. I want to talk to you about something else. We've talked about menstrual pain. We talked about endometriosis and fertility and sexual function. None of those things are gonna kill you. But breast cancer can. And hormones drive breast cancer. This is, a, this is a breast cell, that big gray circle in the middle, that's a breast cell. And those little purplish, pinkish, reddish dots, those are estrogen molecules. Estrogen can sneak right into the cell, right into the cell nucleus, and it can attach to your DNA. And once it does, that DNA can be altered. A healthy breast cell can be turned into a cancer cell, and then it starts dividing, and it becomes two cells, and then it becomes four, and then it becomes eight. That's a spreading cancer. Well, researchers have found out a long time ago that estrogen drives this process. Estradiol is one of the estrogens, and the higher the level of, in this graph, free estradiol, the higher your breast cancer risk. Okay. So I want to get my estrogens in balance, not just for menstrual pain or endometriosis or fertility issues, but to save my life. Okay. Um, let me shift gears. The theme, as you're hearing, is that you want an adequate amount of estrogens, uh, but not too much. This is true with other hormones, too. Let me talk about the thyroid gland. The thyroid is at the base of your neck, and it oversees your body's use of energy. And you can be too low in energy. Low, you can be hypothyroid. And if so, you'll feel weak, you'll be sensitive to cold, your digestive tract isn't working right. And you get up in the morning and you stand on your scale and darn it, you gained another pound. What's this about? And you just feel like your body's not working right. Now the opposite can happen. You can be hyperthyroid. And there, it's just the opposite. Now you're losing weight for the most part. You feel revved up, you've got a rapid pulse, you're nervous, you're irritable, you're feeling, not instead of cold, you're feeling warm, you've got tremors, you're not sleeping well, well, and your hair and skin just don't seem right. What's this about? Well, the first thing, this is thyroid hormone. The hormone requires something to be made, and that's iodine. See those big purple circles? That's iodine. If you don't have iodine, you can't make thyroid hormone. Well, iodine stopped being a problem in the United States pretty much in 1924 because that was the year that the Morton Company started making iodized salt. And iodized salt gives you the iodine you need and hypothyroidism was almost wiped out. Now, modern people today are consuming sea salt or kosher salt or Himalayan salt that might not be iodized unless it's specifically marked iodized on the label. 
Now, the dairy industry would say, take dairy products because they have uh, iodine in them. What they don't want to tell you is that, that in some cases, it's a supplement they fed to the cow. In other cases, it's a disinfectant. The cow's udder gets dragged through mud and gets caked with feces or gets caked with milk. And so they are disinfected with uh, an iodine disinfectant. And some of the disinfectant gets into the milk you're drinking, if you drink milk. Um, and so it, it is a source of iodine, but I'm not quite sure that you want that source. Um, the, my favorite source actually is sea vegetables. If you go to this, the a, a Japanese restaurant, you get sushi, don't get fish sushi, unless you're very well insured. But if you got the cucumber roll or the asparagus roll or the sweet potato roll, the nori that it's wrapped in is a good source of iodine, just like all seaweeds. Uh, if you got miso soup, the little wakame bits uh, have iodine in them too. Or there is, is a similar seaweed called arame. Delicious, it's very fine. And in fact, I have a recipe in Your Body and Balance that it's the, mo the most light, delicious salad you ever had. You take a cucumber and slice it thin, spread it out on a plate, sprinkle a tiny bit of salt on top, add some seasoned rice vinegar and some arame, which is very, very light, a very delicate light flavor. And just let it sit there and get, let the cucumber and the arame get to know each other a little bit. And inside of about eight minutes, you have the most beautiful salad ever. Okay, uh, the biggest reason for hypo and hyperthyroidism in the United States actually doesn't have anything to do, to do with iodine because most people are getting adequate iodine from salt. Um, the biggest reason is antibodies. Antibodies are proteins. They are being made by your body to knock out viruses. But some reason, for some reason, they sometimes knock out your thyroid gland. And that's a big issue. Your antibodies to the thyroid gland can turn it off so that you become hypothyroid, that's Hashimoto's, um, or they can attack the mechanism that regulates the thyroid so that you can't turn your thyroid off. And that's Graves' disease, hyperthyroidism. Well, why would that be? Well, what we believe is happening is that foods, in some cases, trigger that antibody reaction. And what we found, interestingly enough, is that people who eat in a different way have different risks of thyroid disease. The Adventist Health Study 2, with about 66 people, 66,000 people, looked at who has the least hypothyroidism, and it turned out that people who don't eat animal products do the best. People who do the worst are the lacto-ovo vegetarians. They're not eating meat, but they're making up for it with cheese, and the hypothesis is that the dairy protein is triggering antibody production. When it comes to hyperthyroidism, the vegans still do the best by far, but the people who do the worst are the people who do dairy and meat and eggs. They have the most. Again, what we think is happening is that the proteins in these foods are triggering antibody production. Now, there may be other contributors. The research in this is nowhere near done, but there are a number of people who have reversed their hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism with the diet change let me encourage you to talk with your doctor, continue with your regular uh, treatment, but there's no reason not to start a healthy plant-based diet. Okay, one last hormone I wanna to talk to you about, and that's insulin. Uh, you know about insulin as being uh, central to diabetes. Um, back in 2003, the US government gave our research team a grant to try to find a better diet for type two diabetes. We compared a conventional diabetes diet, which is reducing calories, limiting carbohydrate, to a plant-based diet, which was totally vegan. And to cut to the chase, what we track is hemoglobin A1C. This is the same graph I showed you at the beginning when I was making a pitch that people who are concerned about COVID should start on a vegan diet to tackle their diabetes. And yes, a vegan diet is the best way to get your blood sugar control back. Okay, let me put a human face on this. Vance joined one of our research studies. Uh, he lost about 60 pounds. He was able to stop his diabetes medications. His hemoglobin A1C was nine and a half to start, which is not good, but it dropped to 5.3, which happens to be totally normal. In other words, he could go into any clinic in the world and they would not have diagnosed him as having diabetes anymore. Now, when I was in medical school, I was taught that was not possible, but now we've seen it all the time which is wonderful to see, okay? Um, let, me, let me describe how this happens. This is 
one of the cells of your body. This, this is actually my most important slide. Please, please have a look at this slide. Um, that big blue thing is a cell, and that cell runs on glucose, and to get into the cell, those glucose molecules have to pass through those little purple channels to get inside, to, to, to fuel the cell, to, to power the cell. To get it in there, you need a key, and that key is insulin. The insulin comes from your pancreas, and just like a key in a lock, it attaches to those receptors. And once the key attaches to the receptor, it signals those channels to open up and let the glucose come inside. And there it is. Great. If you have insulin resistance, which is the first step toward diabetes, the cause of it is the buildup of fat. See those yellow globs? That's beef fat or chicken fat, fish fat, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. Um, Fat of any kind can pack into the cell. The animal fats are the worst, but, but any kind of fat can contribute to this. And that's causing the insulin resistance. In simple terms, if your cells are filled with fat that you ate, then the insulin doesn't work anymore and you'll get diabetes. So no, it was not caused by eating sugar or bread or potatoes or carbohydrate. It was caused by fatty foods getting into the cells causing insulin resistance. Now the technical term for fat in the cells is intramyocellular lipid, but you can just call it fat inside your cells. My point is this, just as we saw that Robin could get away from her pain and the, pa the other patient who was in our research study was able to get rid of her infertility and Catherine was able to deal, deal uh, with the endometriosis that was so bothersome to her. And people have found that they can get better from thyroid problems. Advance was able to get rid of his diabetes. The body can heal. This is important. If you cut your skin, a Band-Aid doesn't heal you. What, the the Band-Aid just protects you. What heals you is inside the skin cells, in your DNA is the program that allows the cells to find each other again and to attach again. Now it's not perfect, you can have a scar, but your body can heal. If you break your bone, a cast doesn't heal you, it just holds your leg still so that the natural healing process can take over. And this is true if you have estrogen related problems, this is true if you have thyroid related problems, this is true if you have diabetes. The body can heal and we don't wanna neglect that power. So when I found myself discovering that we can change hormones. And that in turn changes a huge number of things. I got excited, so I wrote this book called Your Body in Balance. I just wanna walk you through what this is about. We're gonna start with sex hormones, which we've been talking about today. And there are so many things where food plays a central role from fertility to PCOS to, to hot flashes. If you know how the system works, you've got power. Part two is metabolism and mood. So we're gonna talk about erectile dysfunction and diabetes and thyroid conditions and even mood. All of this is part of this book. And then finally, part three, we're gonna put this to work. So how do I feel better? Well, I need to use a healthy diet. I'm gonna walk you through step-by-step step how to improve your diet. And then we'll also talk about environmental chemicals. So if you're concerned about things you might be exposed to, we'll knock them out. Uh, there are menus, there are lots and lots of recipes that were done by Lindsay S. Nixon and I wanna tip my hat to Lindsay, she made me, uh, she, she provided 65 beautiful recipes that I included in the book. And she sent them along with a note that said, Dr. Barnard, this way of eating cured my menstrual pain too. Talk about validation. Okay, so the old idea was I eat food, I get overweight or I get a health problem, that's it, eat differently. Okay, fair enough. But my point is this once you know how foods control your hormone, you've got power. You've got power against a whole range of conditions that other people took to be just part of life. That's my message. So let me ask you this. I hope you found this information useful, but let me ask you to spread it. Let's change the world. Let's learn about this information. Let's connect with other people and let's share this information with them. And when I say share, I mean make noise. Um, make noise on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, on the phone, uh, whatever you can do to spread the word to other people, I would be grateful for. Um, also, let me mention, if you are looking for somebody to help you, um, our nonprofit clinic, the Barnard Medical Center, now provides telemedicine. If you're in California or Maryland or Missouri or New York or Virginia, Washington, DC, um, also Massachusetts, 
you can call us up or you can just go online, barnardmedical.org. Click and we'll give you information about how you can see a doctor right on your computer screen, right on your phone, right from home. Very convenient. Uh, we were doing, we were offering this anyway before, but when COVID-19 came up, we ramped it up a great deal. And many, many, many people are so thrilled to be able to make a medical appointment, often the very same day, right from home. So that's the Barnard Medical Center. Call us if you like. You can talk to a live human being at 202-527-7500 or um, click online, barnardmedical.org. Uh, the last thing I just want to say, thank you so much for letting me share this information with you. I hope you found it helpful. Um, and thanks to also to many of you who have supported the research we've been doing mm -hmm. at the Physicians Committee. Um, you are the ones who have allowed this work and these discoveries to be made. Thank you so much for making this possible. Betsy, let me go back to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Barnard. Uh, you covered so much information, um, helpful for men, women, uh, animals, our planet, uh, a lot of great information packed into this lecture. Uh, we just have a few minutes left. I'd like to um, ask you a couple of questions. We have so many good ones that our participants have been typing in during the event. Are you ready? You bet. Okay, so a question from Mark who has been following a plant-based diet for three months with no change in cholesterol or triglycerides. Does it take time to improve? Okay, great question. Um, the vast majority of people who get the animal products off their plate and keep oils low will find their cholesterol going down. If this isn't happening for you, uh, let me suggest you do a couple of things. Uh, number one, let's review the rules. Make sure we're avoiding all animal products, including the accidental bit of cheese that the waiter might have put on your spaghetti even though you didn't ask for it. So make sure that there's no animal products, but also keep oils very low, especially coconut oil and palm oil. They will raise uh, your cholesterol. Do that scrupulously for about eight weeks, then get retested. If your cholesterol has stayed high, it's probably a genetic condition. At that point, you'll want to have a, a, con a conversation with your doctor as to whether or not you may want to take a statin. Um, that's a more personal decision. So I have a follow-up question about the oils that you just mentioned. Um, you mentioned keep the oil low and what is, what is that? How low should we go? Okay, um, you'll never go to zero because there are traces of fat, even in something like broccoli. I, I know, how can that be? Broccoli, other green vegetables, send them to a lab. They would tell you they're about seven or eight percent fat. The, um, and the same is true for beans, even fruits, have just traces of natural oils. That's about what you need. If you were to calculate, it would be about seven, eight, nine, ten percent of your, your energy from fat. Um, that's really about all that, sh that you need. What we're trying to get away from is not those natural oils. Um, and there are natural oils in nuts and seeds as well. Little bits of that are okay. What we're trying to get away from are the added oils. And if you're trying to lose weight, be really careful, even about the nuts and the seeds and the peanut butter, because that can power up the fat pretty fast, and that can be a problem. Thank you so much. And I am going to close this out now. We've reached the top of the hour. And we have so many great questions. Uh, you can join Dr. Barnard on Facebook Live daily at noon Eastern time to get more of your answer or more of your questions answered. There's so much good information happening there every day. Um, so thank you all for joining us. You can purchase Your Body in Balance wherever books are sold. And if you're not already a Physicians Committee member, I'd like to invite you to join us at this very critical time for promoting good health and saving lives. So membership starts at only a $20 donation per year and everyone can join by going to pcrm.org and clicking the donate button. So thank you again, Dr. Barnard, and thank you for everyone who joined us today. Please practice wellness and good health. Thank you.